This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, Judith was once one of the most famous women in the Old Testament. She saved her people, Israel, by killing an enemy general single-handed. It was the manner of that killing that inspired countless artists, including Caravaggio, Gentileschi and Klimt. The general was Holofernes, and he fought for Nebuchadnezzar. He was besieging Judith's village, yet Judith, a beautiful young widow, went to his tent, delighted him, and when she had made him drunk, she cut off his head with his own sword. His army fled. For centuries, Judith symbolised the strong woman, or humility overcoming pride, or the weak defeating tyrants, or the danger of the femme fatale. She was sometimes virtuous, like Mary, sometimes deceitful, like Eve, yet always raised questions about where the power lay between men and women. With me to discuss Judith and the paintings are Susan Foister, curator of early Netherlandish, German and British painting at the National Gallery, John Gash, senior lecturer in history of art at the University of Aberdeen, and Ellen Nutu Hall, research associate at the Sheffield Institute for Interdisciplinary Biblical Studies at the University of Sheffield. Susan Foister, what was the story of Judith in the Bible? Well, the story that's told is quite a dramatic one. It's Judith, who was a widow had decided that, inspired by God, she would go out to the tent of the enemy general Holofernes, whose troops were besieging her town of Bethulia. doesn't seem to have been a real town, but it was a crucial town on the way to Jerusalem. So she had the idea, inspired by God, that she would be able to save Israel from the Assyrians. So she took off the sackcloth that she normally wore as a widow and she dressed herself up with an inordinate amount of jewellery in order to embellish her beauty and set off for the camp of the enemy. With her servant? With her servant, with her female servant. And she there persuaded the enemy that um, she could actually tell them how they could take her town. She told a tale that said that um, the Israelites were going to sin by eating sacred food that had been set aside um, specially for them, and she would lead them to victory. And she stayed there for for three days with her own supply of food. She wasn't going to actually take um, the Assyrians' food. And then on the fourth day, Holofernes decided that he would invite her to sup with him in his tent. And she went in there. She ate only her own food and drink. He drank a lot of wine. And as a result... She alone was able to take down his sword, overpower him, um, and cut off his head, the Bible tells us, with two blows. After that, she took out the head to her maid, put it in a sack, took it back to Bethulia, and displayed his head on the ramparts. And after that, the Assyrians um, fled in fear, and the Israelites conquered them. When did this appear in which Bible, and in which Bible is it now? Well, now it's in the Apocrypha, So for the Protestants, it's not part of the regular Bible, but but for the Catholics, it is still part of the Bible as the Book of Judith. And what credence do you give to it? You talked about the village in Bethulia being fiction. What else do you think was fiction? Well, in general, people seem not to have been able to pin down this story to any kind of historical source. It seems rather doubtful how it actually arose as a text in the first place and what language it was in. Excuse me. Is it doubtful that there's a Judith? I think it is quite doubtful there was a Judith, um, but there is a very good story in there that was (laughs) certainly taken up over history for a very long period. And it was taken up very strongly, wasn't it? Very strongly indeed, yes. So that's the story, and you think it's near enough accurate? Well, we don't really know, I don't think. But that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the programme, so we'll work on that premise. (laughs) If anybody has stronger feelings, I'm sure they'll tell us along the way. Ella, uh, there were other virtuous women, uh, 
mentioned alongside Judith in the Middle Ages, those Yale and East Esther. How did she compare with them? Well, it's interesting because Judith was constantly associated with other virtuous women, like the ones you've, you've, you've just um, uh, numbered, particularly with Yale, because Yale um, also delivers the Israelites from a colonizing army by killing their general, Sisera. Um, and um, she kills him in very similar fashion in the sense that uh, she invites him in, um, into her tent. There's, there's some meal involved. He falls asleep, and then she drives a tent peg through his temple, um, which, is, which is very interesting. And it, it is she who, who secures the victory of the Israelites uh, in that respect by delivering Sisera's dead body. But then in its impact is not as, um, you know, as strong as that of Judith, simply because the murder itself is, is very domesticated. You know, it, it is she who invites Sisera in, in her own tent. It is she who um, provides succor and comfort to him. Uh, it, she issues the invitation, whereas with um, Judith, it is Holofernes' tent, Holofernes' invitation, and indeed Holofernes' um sword, whereas, you know, the tent peg is very female, very domesticated. So that's Yale. And, and politically, the impact is, is lesser as well, because Sisera had already been defeated. So that's one thing. Esther, yes, she too delivers the Israelites um, from, um, you know, genocide, indeed the Holocaust in those days. Um, but And Esther too uses her beauty and her femininity, her status um, to secure that, um, you know, the the survival of her people. But then with Esther, she's she's doubly colonized in that respect. Esther is the closeted Jewess. You know, she doesn't tell anybody that she's Jewish until the very end. She uses the power of her husband. She is the queen. You know, and she, it is her body that is actually rubbed and oiled and stretched for the pleasure of, of the king. Um, and whereas with, with Judith, she refuses to be colonized. As Susan mentioned, she brings her own kosher food with her in her bag. Um, she refuses to, to break bread with her enemy. She refuses to actually eat with them. And even though Judith does use her uh, beauty as much as Esther does, there is no pleasuring the king. There's no pleasuring Halofenis as far as the book is concerned. In the account I've read, it says it says of Holofernes after she had delighted him. Now, what does that mean? Um, I don't think she delighted him uh, carnally. Um, I think uh, he... The, the, the Bible um, says something like he drank a large quantity of wine, uh, more than he'd ever drunk before in his mm. life. And he was, and this is beautiful, he was dead drunk. So he was sprawled on his bed. Um, there's no impl- indication that um, Judith took her clothes off at all. So what does this phrase mean? Um, I think her beauty delighted him, but we never know, really. But that stuck with her, didn't it? That ambivalence yes. was around. Um, yes, it, so much so that when she went back to Bethulia, she had to um, vouch for her uh, purity. She said, you know, as God is my witness, or something I'm paraphrasing, it is only my beauty, my face that delighted him, and nothing else. I committed no sin. So, indeed, she, she declares herself to be guileless and... There were other stories in classical literature and in the Bible intertwined with hers. Which one would you choose? There's plenty of Delilah and, and so on. Um, Salome seems near, but she didn't because she didn't do the killing, did she? Exactly. Even though iconographically they're often confused, mm. you know, there are all these paintings and, you know, one can only tell whether it's Judith or Salome depending on what she's they holding. Is it a sword? Okay, that's Judith. Is it a platter? Okay, that must be Salome. So it's an interesting, and that's what Klim does, and we'll, we'll get to that later, mm. I imagine. But it's, um, I, I don't imagine there's anything quite like Judith's uh, murder. And she she stands up she i mean the entire book is a didactic text it's meant to inspire uh, purity piety and devotion um when it's historically accurate which is highly doubtful that's another matter so but you it, think it's highly doubtful that it's historically accurate but it has a propaganda purpose yes i i would probably say that yes when you just said it yes <laughs> <laughs> john gash um yeah. We're mainly going to be discussing paintings, but let's start with uh, a, a statue, the Donatello statue. And can you tell us what that is and how significant it was in the story of the representation of Judith? Yes, I, I think it's fairly significant. One of the striking things about this um, uh, 
this bronze statue that was originally gilded, but it's lost a lot of its uh, gilt now, except there's a bit left on the sword, um, was uh, placed um, in the gardens of the Medici, uh, the new Medici palace, Medici Ricciardi, Riccardi, sorry, um, in the middle of the um, 15th century. Uh, and um, they already had a statue of Donatello's David there. Um, a little bit later, they put both statues outside the palace, I think, as symbols of um, uh, their wish to assert the parallel between these biblical stories uh, and the uh, power of a, of, of, of a small state, Florence, that wanted to assert itself against bigger enemies. So this, can you just tell us what the position of Medici then was a small state? They did have bigger enemies and they were using this yes. to reinforce their own position. I think that's certainly the case, but ironically what happened is that when the Medici got kicked out in 1494 by Savonarola and a, a republic rather than a plutocracy was instituted, uh, the new republican government put uh, the statue of Judith outside the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence uh, and used it as a symbol, uh, an anti-Medici symbol. The Medici were in Rome just as ten years later they would put Michelangelo's David outside to challenge and prevent the return of of the Medici, you see. So, on the one hand, that they, they, they symbolise Florence's wish to survive against bigger enemies like France or, or the papacy, but on another, then it, it sort of switches function, which is quite interesting. It is. What mm. effect do you think it had? Do you think citizens of Florence went past and said, ah, that's us against them, like David against Goliath, <laughs> like uh, Judith against Hollow? Mm. I think it might well have done and, and I, I think originally when, when they commissioned the Judith it's one of Donatello's last sculptures I, I think they probably thought that they wanted to warn their enemies from within the Florentine oligarchy um, not to try anything against them so you know the Patsy conspiracy occurs about 20 years after that's made uh, and they sort of defeat that and string them up so uh, my feeling is that the warning can be multivalent and it certainly in some sense relates to the, to the original story of, of this small Jewish state that is fighting against uh, an army of 120 132,000 apparently that's come from Nebuchadnezzar it's a wonderfully sophisticated form of propaganda, though, isn't it? You have a statue by Donatello and another by Michelangelo, and that will see them off. I think so, but there may be private agendas too. The artist always has to be taken into account. I yeah. mean, his Judith is not that seductive, which she, of course, she takes, as we heard earlier for, from Susan, which she takes off her, her widow's weeds and a sackcloth and ashes and puts on a very seductive outfit. As far as one can tell, it's not very seductive anyway. She's got quite a nice Grecian nose. Can, sorry, yes, can I just ask one more question before? Yeah. Um, did this story change when it moved to Northern Europe? Um, yes, I think there's a tendency in the 16th century, which is when it mainly moves to Northern Europe, for, for the artists in the courts there, in places like Saxony um, and in Flanders, um, to, to, to paint these sort of rather erotic versions, which sort of maybe have to do more with the, the fact that they're further away from the centre of Christian power and they feel they can make more sort of satirical comments. And so Judith is then used as an excuse maybe to paint a new. There's one by Hans Baldwin Green who's uh, famous for his eaves. He just does these sexy pictures. So in fact it's often an excuse. Well let's choose another subject. Did, how far did Judith actually go with Holofernes? Is a question you raised earlier. And it's she, in the book. Well, in the book it claims that she didn't. Well, in the book it says she delighted after she... she oh, the delighted. delight, yes, no, you yeah. refer to that. Well, no, I think, uh, uh, as Ella said, it, that refers to her face and her beauty. Fine. It talks all the time about the beauty of her face which enthralls the guards Fine. and let's everyone. leave it at that. Yes, OK. Yes. I withdraw any any sense of ambivalence. Well, no, but, but the, the artists like to show the ambivalence. I mean, there's a marvellous picture by uh, Jan Sanders van Hemsen, a Flemish artist from about 1540 in the Chicago Art Institute, which shows a completely naked Judith um, wielding her sword in one hand and holding the, the bag into which she's going to put the head rather, rather like a scrotum in her other hand and we see her breasts and her backside all together and clearly this was an attempt at a piece of erotica You wanted to come in
I only wanted to comment about Donatella's um, mm. sculpture. Um, John was saying that she wasn't overtly um, attractive in that, and it, indeed, I think she wears a Marian garb, and that's another female character, that yes. another virtuous woman that Judith would have been Mary. associated. Mary, Mary the, the Virgin, mother, yes. exactly, the mother sure. of Christ. Basically. And I think she's very Marian in Donatella's. Um, and of, of course, in those days, Judith was the second most popular name for a girl after Mary. Um, it was associated with virtue. Yes, very very much so. She was thought of as a type from the Old Testament yes. of uh, Mary in the New Testament. Yeah, Shakespeare himself called his daughters um, Judith and Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, Susan Poister, yeah. can we turn to Caravaggio, mm. who painted her several times, mm. uh, and there's a painting in, in 1600 where the whole thing became, becomes much darker, more gory, more vivid, more of a piece of butchery, erotic butchery, then uh, you tell me about it. Well, you tell them about your. This is the this is the fun now. How can you describe these paintings from on radio? This is like um, a wide screen painting. Actually, it's very large and it's horizontal in format, and it's very dark in 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 its background. And that's one of the things, of course, that Caravaggio is so well known for his paintings that offer these extreme contrasts of light and darkness. So you must be in a very dark tent in Holofernes' tent in Caravaggio's representation and you've got three brightly lit figures, so two on the right and that's Judith and her maid and then on the left you've got the figure of Holofernes um, in his agony of death. So the painting's exactly divided into these two halves and then there's a contrast between Judith who's blonde and in a white top and looks looks quite young and almost frail but obviously meant to be very attractive and her very ancient looking maid who's looking directly at Holofernes um, perhaps in, in shock and she's holding the bag ready to put the head in and Judith herself, as in the Bible, is holding Holofernes' head by his hair and then slicing through his neck. And then the figure of Holofernes lying on, on the bed is almost unbearable to look at because he's so much alive, because he's looking up with open eyes and he absolutely knows what is happening to him as his head is being literally sliced off with a lot of blood by by Judith. And the blood spurting out towards the viewer. The blood it? spurting out towards us as we look in the darkness of, of this tent. And he seems to be struggling. He He's painted um, as a very, very strong man. He's, he's very muscled. And actually, Judith looks quite weak. I mean, in the Bible, she does take two goes to slice off his head. And she looks as though she needs them here. But he looks as though he's sort of trying to raise himself up on, on the bed and, and stop this. But but he can't. It's really, really horrific. What effect did this have, this gory attack on uh, on this man by this woman, when it was shown, first shown? Well, I think Caravaggio was, was trying to impress with his, with his painting skills and trying to make a name for himself by depicting horror in such yeah, a graphic way. Reaction, yeah. It is like a horror film yeah. playing out before your eyes. All right. Ella... Do you think there are any biographical details in that uh, that painting by Caravaggio? Yes, um, I actually do. Um, it, it, it is a self-portrait, I believe. Um, he does actually place himself in the painting as Holofernes. And I must confess, I, I don't find the painting particularly convincing. It is almost like the dress rehearsal in a play. Um, this Judith could not possibly be decapitating Holofernes in that. She, she really holds um, the sword at arm's length. Um, she's not particularly strong, as Susan was saying. Not a drop of, of blood is on her. And it just seems to me that uh, Caravaggio, as Holofernes, is really trying to pull the, the dramatic um, um, ethos of, 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 this, of the narrative onto himself and, and outplay it. He's outplaying it in order to convince, and I'm not convinced what do you mean by, by that. Um, to create that sense of goriness and pain, um, because Judas is not convinced, and I you think don't she think she's a convincing slaughterer. I, I, not this one. This Judith is not convincing to me. Um, and I think he modelled this Judith on Beatrice Cenci, this young girl who had been accused and indeed um, 
uh, found guilty of patricide and decapitated um, just a few years before. And I think for him, Caravaggio is actually stating himself, his own position um, towards Beatrice and saying she was innocent. She was right in killing her father because the father had actually been proved to be rather um, forceful and cruel father, etc., etc. So I think it is, there's an element of autobiography there. Um, Do you go along with that, John? John Guy? Um, it, it's an interesting hypothesis. I don't really know, because I don't think that the uh, the figure of Holofernes' face looks at all like Caravaggio that we know from more certain portraits. Also, he's a very muscular figure. I get the impression that Caravaggio just fancied painting this very muscular man. Um, Judith... Um, could be inspired by, I agree entirely, uh, could be inspired by the execution of Beatrice Cenci, who, who was accused also of incest with her father as well as murdering him. But this was just a political vendetta on the part of Pope Clement VIII. Also, I would say that um, Ju- Judith here is not um, the a prostitute, uh, Filide Melandroni, that recent research suggests that Caravaggio was involved in the circle with her. I don't think it looks like her because it doesn't look enough. You mean the model for her? The it? model, I beg your pardon, yes. yes not Judith model. herself. Mm. What, what do you think he was trying to convey about Judith herself? This is a time when powerful, as I understand it from yes. reading what you three have written, uh, yes. the time when powerful women began to be portrayed in uh, in paintings and so on. Yes, well, I, I think he, he, whether he's as feminist as, as some people are, I don't know, but he, he might be a bit... I, I think if you notice um, her, her blouse actually is semi-transparent and you can see her breasts and her body underneath. So I think he's trying to convey that side of her mission, the sort of the, the fact that she needs to be somewhat seductive even if she didn't succumb as, as those northern painters try to show uh, to, to Holofernes completely. So I, I think that's what he's trying to do. He's quite good at characterising things and but of course he's introduced something that doesn't occur in the narrative in, 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 in the book of Judith which is that he has the servant who in the original text has no name but then in later translations gets called Abra he brings her into the, into the picture and the killing whereas she's actually been sent outside the tent and Judith only takes the head out and gives it to her and then, of course, Artemisia Gentileschi follows that as well. Yes, and has uh, Susan uh, Artemisia Gentileschi has the servant holding down uh, the the victim while the sword falls much more effectively. Maybe will you tell us about uh, Gentileschi and what she did in her version? Mm, well, in her version of the painting, the maid is right there beside her, holding down Holofernes. It's taking two, really, to actually consummate this execution of Holofernes. And an immense amount of blood is being shed as well in, in the version, particularly the one in the Uffizi, where they are working together um, there's an immense amount of blood spurting out and it's right in front of you. And they both seem to be exerting an awful lot of effort. I mean, we were just, I think, saying that um, in the Caravaggio, I mean, Judith does look as though she's having difficulty, whereas in Artemisia Gentileschi's painting, a huge amount of effort is going into cutting off this head and it looks as though it's going to be very successful. Do, do we see her being influenced by Caravaggio? I think she must have been strongly influenced by Caravaggio, though I think you can debate whether or not she would actually have seen the Caravaggio painting that we were talking about, whether that would actually have been visible to her. She must have known his work, and certainly her father, who trained her, knew his work. But she herself seems to have had um, um, intense interest in this subject, and she she was very unusual being a woman who achieved real fame and real success as a painter uh, and brought up in a painter's studio, her father, and so on. Um, there, seemed, there, there was a suggestion, there is a suggestion, that there was her own personal history was involved in the way she represented this. Well, I think this is one of the great debates about Artemisia Gentileschi, who was extraordinarily successful as an artist in her own right. She was the first female painter to join the Florentine Academy in the early 17th century. She was patronised by the Medici. She consorted with intellectuals in Florence. She had a long and very successful career career as a woman painter. So the question arises as to what one knows of her biography. 
um, how that might or might not actually impinge on her painting, and particularly on her versions of paintings of this subject, Judith killing Holofernes, um, when it's known that when she was 17, she was raped by the painter Agostini Tassi, who was, who was um, working with her father, and then there is a very well-documented trial during which she says that after the rape, she stabbed him. So people have made a connection between her representations of the subject of Judith because of what we know of her biography. But whether or not she chose to portray that subject because of her own biography, I think is a debatable point. Can we continue that, Ella? Because she, she says she stabbed him, but there's also a version that says she admitted in court that she continued to have, let's call it, sexual relations with him after this rape. Yes, and I, I think it was because she believed that Tassie would marry her, and um, she accepted that element of deflowering on that promise, on the basis of that promise. And, of course, you know, he had a tenebrous past already. There, are, um, there were allegations that he had, in fact... Um, had his first wife killed um, and the trial was not only for um, Artemisia's deflowering um, and this trial was actually brought by, by her father Orazio but also um, he accused Tarsi of stealing some of his paintings so he wasn't necessarily a very pleasant character but I think Artemisia very young, very impressionable possibly um, very impressed by his talent um, as, a, as an intellectual um, woman I think she, she really believed him she painted several versions of Judith. Did they differ in any significant way? And did they, was she trying to say different things in these different paintings? I believe they do differ. And I, I believe that it shows Artemisia's um, changing her mind about who Ju Judith was. Um, and Susan was saying it's entirely speculative as to whether um, her two most um, gory, most, um, dip, you know, explicit um, paintings of the murder itself um, are a bit of a, a fantasy, a revenge fantasy in her mind on Tassie. Um, she herself suffered pain because during the trial she submitted herself to um, trial by thumb screws and all the rest of it, but she maintained until the end that she had been raped. Um, but the first two... The, 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 so you rushed that. She, they, they put thumb screws on her to get the truth out of her, and the yes. truth they got, what, or the so-called yes. truth, was what? That she she had been raped, uh, but Tassie did, never admitted to it. She, he denied it until the end. Um, he was given a sentence, a very lenient sentence, which damaged uh, Artemisia's reputation quite quite a bit. That's why she she left um, um, and, and and went to Florence. Is there any traction, John John Gash, in comparing a gentle issue with the Caravaggios in the terms of you know man woman? Um, in terms of man woman. Possibly yes, because of what we said earlier about Artemisia's experience of the rape and the, the, the rape trial, um, which obviously was a rape, even if she did continue to have a sexual relationship with Tassie for a year or so afterwards. Um, the, the fact that we have um, two young women in the two versions by Artemisia of the actual beheading, she did five pictures overall, but the other three are post-beheading, um, maybe suggests her feelings which have been very much discussed and I think rather well discussed by Mary Garrard in her book on Artemisia Gentileschi uh, that this was a kind of uh, a, a kind of early feminist sort of thing a sense of sisterhood the two women need to combine together to overcome the tyrant uh, uh, Holofernes uh, and um, they do it with great relish I mean they, it seems to be more realistic we, we said earlier that perhaps um, Caravaggio's one doesn't look so realistic but my, my response to that would be to say well she's just asked for God's help help me this day Lord God of Israel before she does the two cuts so in fact it's a kind of supernatural thing as, as well as a physical thing um, although Caravaggio is very much an artist anchored in the physical and observation directly of models so you've got that difference and you, you've got a younger woman whereas Caravaggio as, as we heard earlier from yourself and others had this old uh, um, wrinkled old lady um, and I think he just that's in the tradition of Venice really in Titian's paintings where they like to have a contrast between an old and a young figure but of course um, none of them should be in the room <laughs> they're, they're just put there I think because you have to compress it's a difficult thing for a narrative painter history painter you have to compress a, a long story into one one scene 
uh, and that's the reason for that. But she's painting at a time when the interest in Judith was still strong, and Judith as a as a, as a real person in Vedicom was in the Bible yes. was completely accepted. Um, I, I think it was accepted, and as as we heard earlier from Ella, that she was thought of as a, as a, as, a, as a precursor and a type and a parallel of the Virgin Mary, uh, and also maybe they were trying to encourage this sense of a strong woman. I think the Church was was never sort of totally misogynistic. Some individual churchmen might have been trying to encourage the sense of a strong whim- woman there were various rulers at the time who were regentesses like in france married the medici later anne of austria and some of the pictures of these strong women virtuous women from the bible and antiquity i think were commissioned to reinforce that sense of the the potential role of, of women as, as as equals and leaders but of course the 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 opposite side of that the reverse side of the coin is that the misogyny often continued and women were thought of as being deceitful and devious and and etc and do we see that susan foister in the work by (coughs) johan lees in the national gallery and the way the way he responds to judith well, Liss, who was a painter yes. from yes. Germany who came to work in Italy like a number of northern painters at this time, certainly shows Judith as a strong woman. It's a very extraordinary composition in which we are really right in the tent, right up next to the headless body of Holofernes and Judith, who has her back to us, and her back is partly uncovered um, and it's a it's a broad, quite muscular back. So it is as though Lys is showing us Judith as a very, very strong woman who has just beheaded Holofernes. And we can just see over her shoulder the head of Holofernes, or at least one eye of his head, and one eye of her, her maid, um, who is obviously putting the head in, in the sack, um, being in, in the tent in this um, slightly unhistorical, unbiblical way. But as you said, it compresses the narrative. But the extraordinary thing is you get this huge back, but you also get her head turning to look at us in this very defiant way, saying, yes, I've done it. I've triumphed. I've carried out this deed for for God. It's a very powerful depiction. Ella, Ella Nuttall, do we have other examples of women painters tackling this subject. Which are the most, can you give us a couple of the most significant? Yes, well apart from um, Artemisia there's um, Lavinia Fontana who was actually painting uh, before Artemisia and um, after that Elisabetta Serrani. There are two versions of the Fontana, uh, one both uh, in Bologna um, from around the 1600 as well and in, in them Judith again is actually portrayed as virtuous very much um, performing this deed, this this horrible act um, on behalf of God in one of them she's looking up towards the heavens and uh, presents the head of Holofernes on a table covered in a black, with a black cloth, almost like an altar. And she lifts her eyes to heaven. There's this beautiful light coming on, on her face, almost God's approval. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a wonderful moment in which, you know, um, her deed is very much portrayed as, you know, being part of a godly deed, um, in other words. But going back to um, Artemisia, her other portrayals... Um, post um, the killing are very interesting going back to her own attitude towards um, Judith um, there's one in Palazzo Pitti in, in Florence where um, she's actually caught with her servant in a moment of um, uh, perhaps fright they're both looking back we see the back of the servant um, but we can actually look at um, Judith and um, that element of vulnerability is taken further by the fact that Judith is resting the sword against her own neck on this beautiful um, skin you know very very clear wonderful skin and it's all exposed and that the metal of the sword being so close to her own uh, neck creates that element of vulnerability and that's why the pommel of the sword actually perhaps invokes uh, the Medusa, the Gorgon, in terms of that power and all of that. And of course, the the other one uh, from 1625, which is now in Detroit, that is the most beautiful one, quite often um, assigned as her masterpiece. And in it, there in the tent, the servant is actually in the process of putting the decapitated head in the bag. Judith is standing up in this beautiful cold dress, and she's... Um, 
um, she still holds the sword with her right hand, but her left is going up against um, the flame from, from a candle. And it is that that I actually find is very telling because her hand is beautifully clean, spotless. It's a godly deed. However, that very hand is casting a shadow on her face. And I think in that Artemisia, perhaps it's reading too far, but this is how I like to read it. Artemisia showing that she accepts that even though it's a godly deed, um, it c- does cost uh, Judith because it's a killing in itself. John Gash, is there any sense in which people were attracted to this because of the erotic possibilities in this uh, event? I think very much so. Um, John Ruskin, um, writing in his Mornings in Florence in the 1870s, uh, said that there, there were millions of these horrific pictures which he disliked. He called them ghastly. But that, 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 that in fact, um, these didn't follow the story as it actually was. And he thought that artists actually represented this subject because it combined uh, uh, the thrill of an execution and a beautiful woman with the additional attraction that, uh, of some, uh, some previously committed sin, i.e. that she'd succumbed to Holofernes to a certain extent anyway. So, so Ruskin was, was, was drawing attention to that sensationalist aspect of many of his right. stories. I think so, because if, if, if you think of um, the Caravaggio and a, a new version of the Caravaggio that I think is by him, but other people don't, that has emerged in, from an attic somewhere in Toulouse, um, it, the, 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 and the Artemisia pictures, they, they are, they're very much uh, parallel to the Elizabethan and Jacobean theatre in a way, where, you know, with the blood and thunder and the, the, the drama, the nocturnal setting for dark deeds. Webster, for instance, the White Devil. Um, so, so I, I think Ruskin had a, a good point there, although he slightly overegged the pudding the way he described it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, we we've, we've just mentioned fleetingly mentioned the servant. Was it, well, sir, have we been fleeting because, because it, the servant is inconsistent in the paintings? She's not in the story, but inconsistent in the paintings. Well, for example, if you go back to the 15th century and you look at Botticelli's representation of Judith um, walking back to um, back to Bethulia with her maid and she's got the head, um, the difference between them is in the way that they're dressed and in their head coverings. And very often the maid, even if she's quite a young woman, has a covered head, whereas Judith is wearing these rather splendid clothes and jewels that she put on. But you who read so much into these paintings. What do you make of that? Um, I think it goes with the representation in which both women are there in order to overcome Holofernes, that um, in other narratives that the maid is just there with the bag ready to put the head in. But in, in Artemisia's paintings, it takes two women to subdue him. And you mentioned Klimt uh, near the start of the programme. <laughs> Would you like to tell us about the way Klimt took this on? Well, uh, Klimt depicts uh, Judith alone, so no servant, <laughs> that's for sure. And in fact, going back to that element of the servant, that the presence of the servant could be in the painting to destabilise that element of guilt. So um, having the, the, pre- the servant present in the tent uh, ensures the message that Judith is pure and she hasn't actually engaged in any hanky-panky with Holofernes. So, you know, because the, the she servant... she has murdered somebody. She has murdered, but not... Uh, so it, it, it's a different kind of sin <laughs> rather than a sexual sin. So Klimt, speaking of sin, definitely associates Judith with sin and death. Um, his works emerge um, from the context of um, increased literacy in, in regards to Freud's psych- psychoanalytical theory. Um, Freud uses Judith um, as an example of um, uh, female, hy- um, not hysteria, uh, fragility. Fragility. Uh, fragility, which is interesting. Hence her prolonged state, widowed status. She refuses all these marriage proposals. And of course, Leopold uh, Zahamaso uh, declared Judith as his muse for his sadomasochistic sexology texts. Um, so the, the, Judith emerges as the sadomasochistic um, ideal 
Um, so in in Judith's first uh, painting, which was actually exhibited as Salome whilst Klimt mm -hmm. was still alive, um, so the curator of that exhibition thought, "Oh my gosh, Klimt must have got his myths wrong. Uh, this can't be chaste Judith. It must be Salome because she's depicted in this poscoital um, moment of pleasure. She's holding the decapitated head of Hol Hol Holofernes close to her womb. There's one breast fully exposed and the other half exposed, and she's she." Her mouth is half open. Um, it, it's really quite a sensual uh, painting, and yet uh, they they exhibited a Salome whilst the frame had very clearly the title embossed at the top, Judith, Judith and Holofernes, which is an extraordinary thing to, to have done, don't you think? And, and the second one um, is also, which is now in Venice, is, is another um, a depiction of um, Judith that is quite often um, exhibited as Salome II or uh, Judith II or Salome because again nobody can make up their mind um, but she's actually in profile uh, walking with the head in her left hand her hands are very claw-like um, which is very interesting so it's, she's very denatured this this woman um, and she's swinging the decapitated head by the by the hair um, which is it's quite disturbing and in the first one, Judith includes um, Assyrian fruit trees behind her, but also lots of either tombstones or scales. So the association to death and sin, the serpent, um, is very clear um, for Klimt. Um, and uh, of course, again, talking about his context, that element of misogyny and anti-Semitic sentiment is very clear in Klimt. Um, you know, there are all these uh, texts uh, admiring uh, Jewish women um, and in the same sentence wishing upon them some terrible fate, uh, which, is, which is an interesting point. But the story finally, John, John gosh, the story mm. faded. J the interest in Judith faded. Why do you think that was? Salome keeps going, as it were. Salome keeps going in the in the naughty nineties, yes, with with Oscar Wilde and Aubrey Beardsley, etc. Um, well, why did it fade? Well, uh, my own view is because it was no longer such a good vehicle for the church and for other political propagandists to pursue it, um, and maybe also people in the nineteenth century and early twentieth century were less excited by this sort of b b b baroque. Uh, exaggeration uh, uh, and, and um, th th they wanted to get away from 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 that excessive sort of uh, cruelty that, that the picture the earlier pictures of Caravaggio and co seemed to convey well thank you all very much thank you John Gash and uh, Nutu Hall and Susan Foyster next week pheromones the invisible chemical signals that many animal species send each other to attract to share the way to food and to dominate thank you very much for listening and the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I think we didn't really talk about those sort of dual traditions that arose in the Middle Ages, the, the sort of religious and the secular, and particularly that tradition of the power of women, where you're sort of inverting what the way in which women are expected to behave in society through a whole series of um, stories of different people, men and women, and Judith can pop up in that context as well. Yes, um, I agree with Susan there. It, it's interesting because whilst on the one hand she's the virtuous woman, the Weibermacht, mm. the power of the women, is actually arising you know, as a, in, a culturally in, in, in the north of Europe. And so you, you have... Um, Hans Bolton Green um, depicting Aristotle and Phyllis with Phyllis seated nude um, on top of Aristotle and then Judith suffers the same fate you have um, Bartle Beam uh, with Judith seated nude on top of Hol decapitated head of Holofernes so it's really quite obscure, macabre um, the idea is that women do use their bodies to subjugate the most intellectual and the strongest of men uh, which is an interesting um, mm. so tradition. those stories I mean, had quite a, a wide circulation in, in print and in different kinds of representation in the Renaissance. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I, I think it goes back to the, what the French call the querelle des femmes, the, 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 the arguments about women, about their nature, um, whether they were virtuous or whether they weren't virtuous. Uh, and artists obviously like to lard in from their own perspective different aspects of this. Uh, and the, the, the non-virtuous aspect is maybe there uh, in a picture of about 1613, of which there's a copy of about 1620 by the Florentine artist Cristofano Allori, 
uh, which shows uh, Judith holding the head of Holofernes with the maidservant in the background. The maidservant this time isn't an old crone. Filippo Baldinucci, who was a biographer of, of Allori, says that in fact this was a portrait of his uh, 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 of Allori's girlfriend uh, with her mother, and that that, that they that this the, 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 the woman led him a song and dance, and, and, and it was a very unhappy marriage. And then the poet Giambattista Marino, looking at one version of this picture, made the kind of uh, emblematic commentary that was not uncommon at that time. He said that and makes almost Holofernes into a hero, a tragic hero, that he was doubly wounded first by Cupid's arrow because he falls for Judith, and then by Judith's sword. And I think it's that sort of documented biographical illusion that perhaps allows people to push the idea that Artemisia Gentileschi is actually expounding her biography in the paintings of Judith and sure, Holofernes. Sure, sure, sure. And they're often um, auto, um, uh, self-portraits, you know, auto-depictions of her. And she, depi- she, ra- she paints so many strong women. Um, she paints Esther, she paints Yale, she paints m- the Magdalen, and they're all in this beautiful golden dress, mm-hmm. um, and as well as Lucretia and Cleopatra. So she's really, and, and Susanna, she really does go for the strong women but it's that virtuosity that she wants to maintain because uh, Bethulia, the Israelite city, um, it, there's a play on words because in Hebrew, Bethula means virgin. Mm-hmm. So she, Judith becomes the personification of Bethulia, the personification of the virgin, hence as a... As a um, as a prototype of Mary before Mary. Um, so as long as they virgin, that's fine. <laughs> it's, there seems to be a trade-off. They're allowed their femininity as long as they don't use it um, on, on, on that um, as power. Mm. Which is interesting. It's also finally from for me an interesting parallel in that in the book of Judith, um, Ju- Judith says that, 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 that Holofernes has been defeated by the hand of a woman. And Artemisia later shows, writes to one of her patrons, Don Antonio Rufus, saying, I will show you what a woman can do. So one, one has this feeling of, uh, yeah. of some kind of inspiration emerging from that text, the book of Judith, for Artemisia in her life and her art, her art especially. Mm. And, and yet in the text you get the feeling that Judith is used by um, God. Judith is used by God to, to shame further his enemies. You know, so it's by the hand of a woman, meaning God is actually so much stronger because even a, one of my women can defeat the, the worst of your generals, as it were. And, and, and Judith is there to protect the horns of God's altar, the text puts it. So it, it's God's own... Uh, power and, mm. and, and phallic power for that reason. Mm. So it's, it's an interesting... <laughs> it, everything she's doing, I yeah. mean, she says she is doing through the power of God. She is carrying out the will of God. And I mean, you, yes. you, you talked earlier about her sin, but I mean, I think in the Bible killing Holofernes isn't a sin it's what saves the Israelites it's what saves Jerusalem and and that's what enables her to be compared to the Virgin Mary she's not just pure and chaste but she's carried out God's will and she's enabled a future for 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 Israel but just sorry I was just saying that in that Detroit painting by um by Artemisia that that shadow that um, her clean hand casts on her face. I think even though the deed is just and the deed is godly, I think Artemisia is saying it does leave a mark. Um, it, it will affect anyone to engage in such, in such a, a bloody act. Um, and I think that the, the, it's quite gruesome, it's very violent. Um, so there, finally, there consequences. producers about to burst in, but can we go back can we go back to our beginnings? Just one second. Do you really, do you think that, how much truth do you think there is in that story? In the story of Judith. The whole story, Judith. In the, the whole tent, s- yeah. story of Judith. Was there a general called Holofernes? I don't think there's any historical evidence to, to support any of it that we well, know did, of. In that case, you did remarkably well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone want to your coffee? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Coffee, 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 coffee. Coffee would be fantastic. Tea. Coffee for me. Coffee. Um, tea, please. Uh, tea, please. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Hello, I'm Gemma Kearney and I want to tell you about Don't You Forget About Me, a brand new hub for great music documentaries from BBC Radio 4. 
Whatever your musical taste, we've got you covered. Whether you want to discover the cult of Aphex Twin or appreciate the genius of Jeff Buckley. My whole philosophy or my whole discovery is that every emotion has a sound to it. Listen to old favourites and make new musical discoveries. I don't have the answers and you shouldn't either. And I'm going to make it really complicated just to prove that. Just search for Don't You Forget About Me in BBC Sounds and subscribe now.